lady like you want to talk to some small time. Psalm 128. This is the ninth Psalm of Ascent, and it contains six verses. Now, Psalm 128 is classified in the lump of Psalms, and they classify as uh, wisdom poetry. Wisdom poetry has its own style, and of course, wisdom poetry was written by men like Solomon. We, I think Solomon wrote the one from last week or the week before that we looked at. So, we're going to go ahead and read Psalm 128. I'll read it in its entirety. If you want to follow along, then we'll discuss the main things, key verses, key phrases, key words. So in Psalm 128, the Bible reads, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his way. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and I shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the side of thy house. Thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee, and a Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. So, as we're looking at Psalm 128, what do you think would be the key verse or verses for Psalm 128? The first and the fourth. And what do they read? Being like, you know, fearing the Lord and being blessed because they fear the Lord. Absolutely. Let me just read them so we're almost all on the same page. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and walketh in his way. And verse 4. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. So we kind of have a reiteration of verse 1. Does anybody have anything else that they might think would be a key verse, or is it just summed up in those two verses by themselves? For me, I went with verse 1, so I think we pretty much have it summed up, because the whole psalm is talking about the fear of the Lord and the results of the fear of the Lord. Now, what about key phrases? What might be some key phrases? Jesus, 
They worship all these other gods, no more than happy to throw Jesus in the mix out of fear, with a literal fear out of trembling, that he might hurt them, but there's no walking in his ways. We'll do this, but we're also going to worship all our other gods. So when we're looking at this, it's not just a matter of the fear of the Lord, but also walking in his ways. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add for key phrases? Because if you walk in his ways, you'll, like, you'll more or less show like fear and reverence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if we get down to it, if you're walking his ways and you're fearing him, then naturally you should have a relationship with him. Right. Because that all comes to walking in his ways. It's our relationship with God. It's not just enough to believe in him. Some people think it's just enough to believe in him, but the Bible clearly states even the devil believes and trembles. Exactly, exactly. Now what about some key words? What are some key words within Psalm 128 that would summarize Psalm 128? The Lord shall bless thee outside. So maybe bless the Lord. Is there anything else that might be a key word? Not a key phrase, but just one word that would describe this whole passage. What about, I threw in a few more in there. I put in fear. I put in fruitful, because if you fear the Lord, he will make sure you are fruitful. Yeah, yeah. Labor, because and then you can walk in. What's that? Would fruitful be considered under blessing? It would be. Yeah. It would be. I have labor, because we have to walk in his ways. We have to labor. Right. And then, of course, prosperity, because if we walk in his ways, You'll make sure that we prosper. And peace. And peace. Absolutely. Now, when we're looking at Psalm 128, does it inform us who the author is? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. So when it comes down to Psalm 128, who's the author? Probably Solomon didn't say it, probably. It's hard to say because there were other ones. Only thing we can truly say with the Word of God is if there's no answer, we don't know. Right. That's all we can say. Is we do not know. One thing I do look forward throughout our studies is was any portion of this song quoted in the New Testament? Because when we turn to the New Testament, we'll read things where David was quoted, not a bone of him should be broken. We'll see them write about the prophets. Isaiah, I referring to Isaiah, or Elias, referring to Elijah. So the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. But when it looks at, up here, when we look at Psalm 128, it does not appear any portion of that was quoted in the New Testament. Poetic style, I could not come up with when it comes to the history of Psalm. There's no real background to it. There's nothing really that alludes to it. We read um, Psalms before about the art being taken to Jerusalem, so we might be able to surmise, but there's nothing in here to give any indication because it's talking about a man walking in God's ways. It's talking about his life, how he will prosper. So there's no real indication that maybe really when this was written, but it is a psalm nonetheless. Now, one thing we know about the Word of God is there's one figure that is seen throughout the entire Bible. And that is Jesus Christ. So when we look at Psalm 128, according to Keith L. Brooks in the Bible Summarized Handbook, he said that, wrote this, Those may be assured of a prosperous and happy life who make Christ Lord of their lives and evidence it by constant conformity to his will. So once again, we have that relate the importance on the relationship with God. Now, when we look at Psalm 128 and verse 1, <coughs> and the Bible reads, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. When we're looking at this, automatically something should pop out at us once again. And what do you think that is? 
has to do with the way the King James Version of the Bible is written. Lord's all in caps. Lord's all in caps. So when we're looking at these Psalms, for the most part, we're indicating that this is Lord God, Jehovah. Anything that you need him to be is what he is. We're not talking about Jehovah Raphael or Jehovah Shalom for God in that situation. We're talking about it don't matter what situation you're in or what you need from God. He is everything that you need. And when we look at this passage, it is an all-comprising passage in the sense that it doesn't narrow in one specific aspect of life. We've read about people having others coming against them, throwing fiery words at them, attacking them with fiery darts, their words, the language. This is just life in general. So God is there no matter what you need him to be. But it comes down to one thing. I should say two things. We need to fear God or reverence him. And we need to make sure that we're walking in his way. And really, with us as Christians, that's what we should be doing on a daily basis anyhow. We should be constantly fearing God, reverencing him. Making sure that we're not doing anything that would give God a bad name. If you go throughout the word of God, there's a passage that says, you know, sometimes we make sure that we do, don't do things because of the heathen around us. It might give them a bad impression of God. So we need to make sure that we're doing it. If we're reverencing God and making sure that we're doing everything we're supposed to, we are fearing him. We're, we're making sure that we are going forward and laboring. And it falls into the verse that Jesus Christ used to summarize up part of the, of the Ten Commandments, or the commandments in general. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. That ties right in with verse 1. And we fear the Lord with our whole heart, with our whole mind, with everything that's within us, we'll make sure that we are walking in his ways. When we look at Psalm 128, it simply continues on from previously on Psalm 127. And I, I jumped a little bit ahead of it. The last one, we saw the children as arrows, whereas this one, we'll see them as olive plants. When we look at the last Psalm 127, it focuses simply on the parents and the children, whereas this Psalm doesn't just look at the children and the parents, but it goes on for generations. So when we're looking at Psalm 128, it's showing the longevity of the patriarch. Because really when we get down to it, what is the reason that men have always wanted to have boys in the first place? <laughs> Carry on the name. They want to make sure that their lines pass on and on and on. It's a way for them to be remembered. And when we're looking at Psalm 128, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the longevity of the family. And not just along with that, but we're also seeing the longevity of the principles instilled with those child, children being raised up. Not just what the, parent, the father taught them, but what the mother installed within them as well. So when we look at 128 and verse 1, it shows us and emphasizes the reverence that we need to have for God. And for God to have his way in their life. Sorry. Okay. Now when it comes down to each of our lives, really, that decision on how we let God move upon us, that decision is each one of us. And it's not always an easy thing because there are constantly two struggles going on in each of our lives. There's the flesh, or the natural man, and there's always the spiritual man. And they're always at odds with each other. But we need to make sure that we are constantly feeding the spirit, because that way the flesh is constantly subdued. If we truly fear God, and we are going to make sure that we walk in his ways, we're going to make sure that we're feeding the spiritual man. And we're not going to hold on to the thing of this world tightly because in reality, as Christians, 
we've been long, in church long enough that we should have enough wisdom to know that we do not need to strive for a material gain in this lifetime. And if we've been in church from little on up, that wisdom has been there. It's just whether or not we apply it. Because we can try to prove anything and everything we want in this world, but what happens when it comes down to the end of the life? Or what happens maybe when people reach retirement age? There are people at work that, well, all my life I know there's a woman, she collected peanut butter jars. But now they're up there in years, so you know what she's doing? My children don't want these, so I need to sell them. I need to get rid of them. You know, we spend so much of our life accumulating material things that in the end, we just got to get rid of it. Nobody else wants it. But yet, we've spent all this time, all this portion of our life is gone because we were trying to collect it. But life is but a vapor. And I'm not saying it's not that we don't need to have nice things or anything like that because God does bless us. But if we got down to it, we probably all have a certain area in our life that we just like. We enjoy these things. But I'm reminded of Corey Ten Boom, who said, Hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. You know, sometimes those things that we enjoy, God asks us to give up. That because it's taking up too much time of our lives. Where he could be, um, we could be building, be building our relationship with him. We could be talking through prayer. We could be communicating. We could be reading our Bible. It's not that they're bad. And sometimes, God asks us to give up things simply because he wants to see how willing are we to chase after him. If you think about Moses, he was willing to give up more than the children of Israel when he went on Mount Sinai. They were fearful for it. But yet he went up and spent time with God. Mount was covered with smoke. Who knows what was going on? But yet he got to see God face to face. He lost 40 days of his life on that mountain. But he was with God. Well, sometimes God asks us to give up things, not because of sin. He wants to see what's most important in our lives. Is it him or is it something else? But here's the thing with God. Every time he asks us to give up something, he'll always give us something so much better. And if we're willing, and we give up something, say, God, I'm giving this up, and I'm going to spend more time with you. He may say, oh, you didn't have to do that. No, but I want you. But he'll still give you a blessing. Something greater than you ever, something like whatever you gave up, he will give you something better. In verse 2, the Bible states, For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thou shalt eat the labor of your hands. When we look throughout the word of God, there is such a thing as sowing as the laws of sowing and reaping. You really do sow what you reap. The Bible talks about the wages of sin is death, but the gift of life, God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Son. You're sowing either you're sowing good or you're sowing bad. You're either sowing for eternity, sowing to spend eternity with God, or you're sowing to spend eternity in hell. We're constantly accruing that. We're laboring. And what we labor and what we plant is what we will eat. But if we labor for God, if we reverence Him, you know, God will make all the provisions that we could ever ask for in our lifetimes. Would someone please read Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25? Matthew 6 and verse 25. Yes, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. 
Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. It is not the life more than meat, and the body more than, than rain. So when we're looking at this passage, God says, don't worry about your life. I will take care of everything. But the only way that God's going to take care of everything in your life and reality is if we're walking in his ways. The sinner doesn't have this promise. Only the believer. And life does get rough sometimes. But what are we laboring for? How are we laboring, I should say? Are we laboring for heaven? Or are we laboring to spend eternity in hell? All those things play a role. But if we are laboring for heaven, if we are planting good seed, if we are fearing God and building that relationship with him, we will reap good things. For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. The thing about the person who labors is, if he's laboring with God, he's making sure that he's planting that seed, not on stony ground, not on ground that's not been dug up and tore up, but he's making sure that this seed is falling in good soil. He's doing everything he can to make sure that this seed is going to be profitable for him. If we go back to the time, biblical times, the farmer, this was his livelihood. If he planted bad seed, if he planted it on the wrong type of dirt, if it fell by the wayside, if the birds ate it, that was profit out of his pocket. That was food out of his family's mouth. He had to make sure that what he had, he was wise with. He planted it in good manner. He planted it in the best way possible that he knew how. In times of drought, he planted it in a place where he thought it would best grow. It, made he, it was a place that was easier for him to take water to or to get a water supply from where it was to the crop itself. But he was laboring, making sure that soil, that seed would be good seed, that in the end it would be profitable for him. And the only way the Bible tells us that we're going to have profitable seed is for the man who fears God and walks in his way. And as long as that man is fearing God and walking in God's way and doing everything he can to apply wisdom, God's going to make sure that that seed grows. And that that individual has enough. Ever find that in your own life? Maybe you gave when you really didn't have it. Maybe you went out of your way to help somebody you didn't know. Or maybe it was somebody you knew, didn't know you just took time out of your busy schedule, you stopped where you were, and you prayed for it. You're planting seed. And that seed will come back more than you could ever imagine. And honestly, if we are laboring for the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says that where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. If you're planting your seed to lay up in heaven, I can promise you when we get to heaven, what we receive up there is going to be far greater than God could ever give us down here. God will take care of the natural. He will take care of our everyday supplies. But if we are fearing him and only walking in his way, in verse 3, the Bible states, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. The wife, she is part of this. The man provides the home, and that vine has some place that it can grow. That vine needs something to attach itself to. Otherwise, it will not grow it will not be fruitful. Any vine that you see growing has itself attached to something, whether it's a stall, whether it's a side of the house. It needs that object to grow because it needs to latch itself onto so it can pull itself up even higher. The wife is like a vine. The man provides the house, and she makes sure that the house is fruitful. In today's vernacular, we would say the man provides the house, but the woman makes it the home. You know, she's the one that teaches the children. She's the one that raises them. She's the one that instills godly value in them. 
you provide the house, and she will make it flourish. And thy children shall be as olive plants. When we look at society around us, what's something that might be on the dollar bill or maybe a $20 bill? I can't remember what it's on. But the eagle has it clutched in its, in its talons. It has arrows in one. And olive branch. And what does an olive branch represent? Peace. What did we talk about last week with a man's children? He shall go to the gates of the city, and he will confront those that are coming against his parents. He will be the one that buffets. He will be the one to make sure that his parents are taken care of in their old age. He will do what he has to. He will put down all strife and quarrel that may come against his parents. <coughs> Not only is it peace, but what he shall be all the plagues in this passage of Bible states. Olive trees. When we look at olive trees, olives were grown mainly for their oil. And when we look at their oil throughout the Old Testament, does anybody know what the oil was used for? For the lamps. So it was to provide light in the midst of darkness. They would also use this oil for cooking. They would use it to rub on the skin and their um, hands on the hair to make it shiny, to make it healthy. They would use it in religious ceremonies. But you couldn't just do that from one branch. You had to use an olive tree. An olive tree will keep bringing back olives year after year after year. If you take a branch off, you just have that branch when it dies, that's it. But man, olive trees, that means that his children, his inheritance, is going to be well planted. Why? Because the wife who took care of the home and planted these values with them. She taught them what was right and what was wrong. She taught them to fear God and to walk in his ways. And because of that, the children would be standing firm in what they were taught. Train up a child in the way he shall go, and he will never depart from it. Those things are always there. This man's children are as olive trees. So what's up with the tree? Once it's planted, it's there until either it dies or it's taken down. But olive trees can survive for hundreds of years. That is saying that what you instill in your children, the man who walks in the ways of God and fears God, his inheritance can stand the test of time. It can go on for generations and generations and generations because of what was planted in his children, that fruit will be brought forth time and time and time again. This is not like the wild olives that Paul mentioned in 11, Romans 11, 17 to 47. These grow in little bushes towards the ground. They don't, they're not good for much medicine. But if you nurture it and don't let these olives go wild, they can grow into a huge tree. Now, I realize it's an entirely different type of olive, but still. For the person who does not fear God, their children aren't going to be as the individual that fears God. They're going to be wild. They're going to run them up. Their name may not last for them forever, ever. Or they're going to be low light. You know, the family's name is going to be dragged through the mud. It comes down to the individual's that fear God and walk in his ways. Going down to verse 5, uh, Psalm 128. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. So one thing that was imperative that we've seen in past songs for the Hebrew was the peace of Israel. That was their main city. It was a holy city. It was a place the temple was kept. You shall pray for the peace of Israel. For the person who walks in the ways of God and fears God, the Bible says, God shall bless thee out of where? Zion. But where's Zion? Which Zion is he talking about? Is he going to bless you out of, Z out of Jerusalem, um, physical Zion? God does not physically dwell on the Mount Zion over in Jerusalem right now. He dwells on heavenly Zion, which means that 
if you fear God and you walk in His ways, God's going to bless you from heaven. He's going to make sure that your things are taken care of. And I'm not teaching loud or out of prosperity. I'm just teaching you the Word of God. If we walk in His ways, if we reference God, He will bless us. It does not say that He will bless us with $5 million. It does not say that He will bless us with a new Corvette. It does not say He will bless us with a mansion and a boat and 500 vehicles. But He will bless us. If you think about our lives, we are truly a blessed people. We were able to get out of bed this morning. We were able to stand up and walk on our own two feet. We didn't have to use a cane prop. We didn't have to use crutches. We are not bed bound. We don't have this horrible disease, or we don't have that horrible disease. We have a roof over our head. Are our bills paid? How's our health? Is there money in the bank? And if there's not, you know, do we have enough for the next bill? Do we have food in our ca kitchen cabinet? Do we have children? Do we have grandchildren? You know, I realize depending, they might be a curse sometimes, but depending, and I'm not going there, but for the most part, it's a blessing. There's nothing like when my little niece comes through Walmart and says, Uncle Josh in. We are a blessed people. The Bible doesn't say that God will bless us with everything our hearts desire. He did say if we seek him with our whole heart, he'll give us the desires of our heart, but that doesn't mean that we're going to get everything we ever dreamed of. Because God wants what's only good for his children, and it might take us away from him. But if we walk in his ways, he will bless us, not out of the earthly line, but he'll bless us out of the heavenly line. And which means whatever riches that God has at his disposal, which we know is everything, anything that God has at his disposal, which we all know is everything, he owns the cattle on thousand hills, he will make sure that he blesses us. And going off on a side note, sometimes the reason people get blessed only a little bit is because they're stingy with God. Because the truth of the matter is, if we can't give to God what is his in the first place, how can we really expect a blessing in the end? For those, the, because when we get down to it, when it comes to tithing, tithing is not an option. God says we are to tithe. And if you're not tithing, why should God bless you? Or if you do tithe, or maybe you, and you maybe make a $2 million a year, but you only give $2 extra for a top, you know, on top of the tithe, why should God bless you exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think? Sometimes the reason we get less small is because we're only willing to give small. But God will bless us out of Zion for the individual that fears God. And he will bless Jerusalem because we have walked in his ways and we have feared him. And then it goes on in verse 6. Ye thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. So it's not just a matter of God's going to bless you, and you'll see your children be successful, but you're going to see your children's children. You're going to see your grandchildren. You're going to be there long enough to spend time with them. You're going to see them grow up. And not just peace upon Jerusalem, but peace upon the entire nation. Peace upon Israel. Peace upon your people. The man who fears God will get to see his grandchildren. And if someone will please read Proverbs 13, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. Now, we were talking about um, 
family names earlier. When we're looking at this passage, the man who fears God and walks in his ways, he's going to see his legacy continue, is what we're looking at. He's going to see his inheritance. <laughs> if it's one thing that men throughout time has always wanted to have done, is for them to be immortalized. Why did people way back in the Roman times fight the gladiatorial type uh, games, sometimes voluntarily? Because they wanted to have their name go on. They wanted to be famous. Why did people compete in the Olympics in Rome? Because during the Roman time, it wasn't just a matter of receiving the laurel crown, because that faded with time. But they would have a, a sculpture created of whoever won the Olympics. And when you have a sculpture created, it stands the test of time, which means your legacy continues on and on and on. Nowadays, we have it written down. Information is rampant. We can look up and see who won the Olympics last year, who got gold medals, what country was best. But what's one way that men probably still would have done for the way to be immortalized? You go to the White House, you go to a museum, you're going to probably see a bust of Abraham Lincoln, sculpture, statue, George Washington. These men were not immortalized just by history itself written down, but you have big, prominent figures of them throughout different locations of the United States stating that this person did this. They're immortalized. In Psalm 128, the legacy of the man who fears God, or the woman that fears God, as long as they walk in their way, their legacy is going to continue on and on and on. If they train up their children right, it's going to continue on throughout their children and their grandchildren yet. Well, this is what mom and pop did, or this is what grand did, or this is what great grandmother did. It's not just a matter of meeting that individual, but it's a matter of the inheritance being, their legacy is passed on and on and on. But it's only going to happen if we fear God and walk in His ways. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels by the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth. Now the Holy Ghost may move as He so desires, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips to bring forth the words you have us to hear. And anoint our minds and our hearts to receive it with gladness, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would be transformed even farther into the image of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.